It's how you know if your dreams are acceptable. If you tell somebody your dreams for your life, and I just spit and hit somebody, blessings. If you tell somebody your dreams and they don't laugh in your face, you need to go rewrite your dreams. Let me say it again. If we were to hang out tonight, I would go say, what are you dreaming about doing? If I don't laugh and go, whoa, I'm not sure that you love Jesus like you say you do. Because you know what grace will do? Grace will get your eyes on Jesus and off yourself. And so now when people laugh at me, when I tell them, I remember we started our church in New York. People are like, what kind of people do you want to reach? You want to reach the millennials? You want to reach the white demographic? You want to be a diverse church? I said, no, we want to reach everybody. And someone's like, you can't do that. When you plant a church, you have to give a mailbox drop and you have to do a series on Ecclesiastes and you have to do all. And I was like, no, no, we're going after everybody. People laughed at us. And I was like, thank you. Thank you for laughing. Now I know I can go do it. And does good things. And if so, only to a select group who may be enlightened or predestined. And yet, we would have no hesitation in witnessing to the fact that our God not only does good, but does so unto all. Moreover, according to the scriptures, God is not just described as having the qualities of goodness and doing good things, but God is identified with the very concept of good. The concept of good seems superficially simple. However, the more we look into it, the more profound and meaningful it is, particularly in relation to the one and only true God, such that in its most profound and ultimate meaning, it applies to Him alone and to no one else. I don't call those people haters. Y'all young people like to call anybody who disagrees with you haters. I call them dream validators. So rather than throw the hater thing on, oh, they're a hater, now you're a dream validator. What are you dreaming? It's okay to dream. Don't let some mean Christian tell you you can't dream. It's your job to dream. It's God's job to make it happen in His way, in His plans. But you have every right tonight to go back, scrap your dreams and say, Lord, let me write my life out as if you were in control and not me. You hearing me tonight? Some of y'all got to open up your eyes. You have the whole world, the whole life literally in front of you. We get a glimpse of this important and ultimate meaning of good when a certain rich young man called Jesus good master. Instinctively, we would think that the rich young man addressing Jesus in this way reflected respect and great insight. And yet, somewhat surprisingly, Jesus tells him, Why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. For Trinitarians, this verse clearly poses a problem. For if Jesus is God, how can he not be good, even in an ultimate sense? Most Trinitarians twist the clear, natural meaning of Jesus' words to suggest that he was in fact somehow affirming his equality with God, contrary to the straightforward meaning of the verse. For us as students of the Bible, however, there is also a difficulty in that Jesus' statement that God alone is good seems to run contrary to our understanding that Jesus was and is good. After all, we are told that he was holy, harmless, undefiled and separate from sinners. Jesus' statement that God alone is good occurs in the context of the rich young man asking Jesus what he had to do to inherit eternal life. Jesus told him to follow the commandments to which he replied that he had kept them from his youth. Jesus told him, however, that he lacked one thing, treasure in heaven which he would obtain by selling what he had. Give to the poor and take up the cross and follow him. Now a natural question arises as to how the context relates to Jesus' correction that God alone is good. If God breathes on it, who knows what could happen. I remember going to visit a young person in the hospital who had dove into a pool and broken his neck. I remember sitting there holding his hand, praying for him, and in my own heart I'm going, wow, this is is pretty heavy, Lord. I don't understand this. I don't know why this has happened. And I remember seeing this young man cry and say how devastated he was. Prayed for him, left, couldn't get him off my mind. He called me. A week later, he said, we got, we got youth tonight, right? I said, yeah, we got youth. He said, can you, uh, can you save some room? I said, yeah, yeah, we, 
we can fit your chair in there. Calls me about 20 minutes before you start. So I go outside and I see a bus pull up. And out comes my friend in his wheelchair, followed by six other people in wheelchairs. And he said I was in rehab. And I just figured if I'm going to be here, I might as well be here. And I invited everybody I could. You better believe we ran into church, cleared out that entire row. So imagine a room like this. And in the front row, there was six or seven people who were severely disabled due to tragic things. The moment that preacher gave an opportunity for people to get saved, the half of that row was covered with people in wheelchairs, some with their hands up, some couldn't even lift their hands, but they lifted their head. You know where it started? One guy saying, I refuse to let my earthly limitations hinder my heavenly call. During God's creative process, as God completed each part, he saw that it was good. And in fact, when God saw everything that he had made, it was very good. We might ask, in what way was God's creation good, or even very good? As far as the actual physical part of the creation is concerned, one might suggest that existing is a good thing compared to not, not existing. The Genesis account seems to go beyond this, however. The account suggests that God was pleased with how all the components of the creation supported and interacted with one another, and that it turned out how he had purposed. And therefore we can add proper function and intended purpose to existence as aspects to what is meant by good, or very good here. Insofar as the moral human part of the creation is concerned, we know that Adam and Eve were sinless despite having moral free will and therefore were able to have a close relationship with God till the fall. In this way, the moral free will in human creation was good prior to the fall. You can't even imagine living without him. Those moments, and that's the challenge tonight. There's going to come a day, and we're done, you can close your Bibles. Going to come a day when the list is too big, the burden is too much, and the devil's going to come and say, see what you did? You were dreaming too big. You can't do this. You're about to preach to your youth ministry. You can't even string together some good sentences. Who are you? Those are the days you got to remind yourself, oh, I've been called from grace. And I've been covered in grace. My son, matter of fact, his name is Roman. He is amazingly cute. He's got giant glasses. Um, he will be one of the NFL's only white defensive backs someday. That's how quick he's going to be. That was funnier in my head. I don't know why y'all didn't laugh. This is Florida, land of the awesome DBs. He's going to be a two-sport athlete. He's a legend. But right now, he's a little guy who contributes nothing to our home other than laughs, giggles, and smiles. And the other day, I came home, and my wife, who's Australian, she said, your son, all the husbands in here, when your wife says, your son, you know something's wrong. When he does something good, it's our son. When it's something bad, your son. Ordered two hundred dollars worth of Power Rangers on our iTunes. I said, "Are you serious?" She said, "I'm serious." I said, "I got this." And I went and confronted my son. I said, "Son, there have been allegations made. Rumors have been spread. Offenses have occurred. Is it true, son?" that you ordered two hundred dollars worth five six seasons of power rangers he said yeah dad i said oh really that nonchalant yeah dad. i said here's what's gonna happen now son you realize you don't have a job you realize you can do nothing in life right now that i don't allow you to do here's what's gonna happen you're gonna get a job tomorrow you are gonna pay back every dollar of my money that you spent without asking because you need to learn a lesson and he looks at me and i said what are you gonna do tomorrow son what are you qualified to do? He goes, uh, I say, he said, can I clean the house? I said, no, it will be worse. He said, can I cut the grass? I said, no, you don't even know what grass is. You don't even know what lawnmowers are. He said, can I work at Starbucks? I said, son, you are not qualified. So what are you going to do now? And he looks at me and his glasses fog up. He's like, he goes, dad, can you just pay up for me? I promise I won't do it again. I'm like, of course. And I hugged him. And I'm the softest dad ever. And it was like a Hallmark moment. But I walked out of there. And I saw myself in my son. Because I walked out of there thinking, how many times do I get momentum as a Christian? 
or I do what God's calling me to do. And then I get in these moments where I'm overwhelmed and then I start looking at myself and my own capability. And so many times I feel like God is saying, not only have I covered your tab, not only am I here for you, but you can go even further. You didn't get yourself here. So how do you ever think you were going to get yourself there? It's the same Jesus that saved you here. It's the same Jesus that called you here. It'll be the same Jesus that covers you out here. So what in the world do you have to fear tonight to leave here and tell this city about the good news of the grace of our God that has set you free?